all that He has done for us. Uh, and once again, to be built up in that faith, that saving faith uh, that God pours out to us. And I was thinking as I was uh, preparing for worship this morning when we had our noon service about how uh, Clay sets that crown of thorns on the light and that silhouettes behind the cross. Um, and I was thinking about our journey toward the cross and ultimately the, the empty tomb and how as we are drawing closer to the light of resurrection and hope and promise, those shadows are growing. And so it was true in Christ's life as he journeyed toward his passion, the shadows would grow deeper and darker as sin would rear its ugly head in the lives of the religious leaders and the people that would condemn him unto death. But the very thing that needed to happen so that we would have life in his name. As we begin our worship here this evening, uh, we stand together as we enter the presence of our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we enter your courts with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of how great you are to us. Lord, tonight and again we count the cost of our sins. All that it would take to buy back life with you, and that would only come through the blood of your son Jesus Christ, the paschal lamb that was slain to provide us life everlasting. God, help us to know the cost of this sacrifice. Help us to turn from our uh, deceitful ways, the ways we cheat this life that you give to us, and we seek the shortcuts of life and the ways that, that we can pursue what we think is right, but what ultimately only leads to death. God, remove this death from us once again and give us hope, give us peace through what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we gather before our God, we enter into his presence with a time of confession, a time where we recognize how good God is and how broken we are, but how willing that God is to fix us and to make us whole again. I invite you to join with me in a prayer of confession in your bulletins and on the screens. We pray together. Lord, forgive us for the lustful thoughts and ideas that we have allowed to enter into our minds and color our lives. Forgive us for the selfishness and greed that has created conflict in our relationships and marriages. Forgive us for loving our own wants and desires more than the desires you have for us, the plans you have prepared for us to live out. Transform our hearts and minds that we might see your perfect plan for our bodies and our relationships. Teach us to see the world as you see it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our focus tonight is on the subject of lust. The ways we have taken God's design and God's plan and we have shortcutted it. We have taken what did not belong to us and we have overreached outside of God's boundaries. These and all our sins we lay before God tonight. And he has heard our cry for help, our cry for mercy. And because of Jesus Christ, because God gave us his only son, we are privileged to know and it is my privilege to stand before you as your pastor to announce to you that Christ has forgiven all our sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Out of great thanksgiving, let us sing together.
congregation may be seated. We take a moment right now to hear again and reflect again on what the scripture says about this suffering servant, the Lord Jesus. Paul wrote about it uh, 20 years later in 2 Corinthians, his second letter to the Corinthians, and he described who Jesus was and what he did with these words. God made him who never sinned to become sin for us, that we might receive the righteousness of God. In our account tonight, we're going to see how Jesus even was recognized by Pilate as the innocent one, and yet that innocent one was condemned to death for us. While a guilty one, Barabbas, was set free. We are all Barabbas. The punishment that we should have received was put on Jesus, and he was condemned. And we, the guilty ones, are set free. We focus on these words taken right out of Matthew's gospel, word for word, with dramatic players to bring them to life. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. Jesus replied, When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. They answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let 
let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. Tonight you and I recognize that what happened there had personal and powerful impact for each of us. That because Jesus suffered and died for us, we have life forever. In just a moment, we're going to, uh, after we sing this next song, join in prayer time. And uh, we have um, some families we want to remember in prayer tonight. I just met with Gloria Martin's family, and on Monday evening, God called uh, Gloria home to heaven. And we can know she's in heaven because she believed that Jesus died for her. And the Tolly family uh, experienced the loss of... Dale's son, uh, and I think it's mother-in-law to that son, uh, and about 1.30 today, didn't have, couldn't share this at lunch, but about 1.30 today, it was a good day for my mom to go to heaven, for which I'm very thankful. And so we sing tonight, uh, we who yet live here. Kind Father in heaven, we're here tonight because we need you to watch over our lives, to keep your hand upon us, 
to guide us every step of the way through life's challenges, through its ups and downs. And Lord Jesus, uh, in a very special way, we need you. Without your shed blood, the outcome of our lives and our eternal future would be very clear. We would live separated from you. We would live in brokenness and futility here. But you've come, not just to die for us, but to shepherd our lives, to carry our burdens, to intercede for us with sighs, to be here for us. And Holy Spirit, how we need you. We need you to continue to bring conviction, to help us trust and stand on those precious promises, to make the word come alive, to quicken our hearts in worship, Bring us your comfort. And so, Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit, we need you. Thank you for being here for us. Savior, as you've taught us now, we pray together that prayer you've given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We take a moment right now to bring to the Lord our gifts and our offerings, and uh, as we do that, uh, please take a moment to fill out one of the worship cards that are there in the pew racks in front of you. I do also want to remind you as we gather our gifts tonight, uh, most of you know we've been taking on some pretty hard-hitting topics here, and we've called uh, death to our sinful struggles. Uh, in accord with Colossians 3, put to death what is within us. And uh, tonight, uh, Pastor Eric has just a very, very precious message about lust. But it's very direct. And it's hard-hitting. And for some of you, parents of just young, young children, it, I would not... Uh, it's direct, okay? I would not want to... Uh, for you to go home and say, oh, I wish my kid wouldn't have been a part of that. So if, if, if you're a parent that has that concern, we've uh, down in 122, Jen uh, is gonna have a special uh, time with kids if you feel like you're, I mean, there aren't X-rated pictures or anything like that, but uh, it, it's direct, okay? And, uh, um, and uh, you're certainly free to send your kids down and Jen will take them down to 122 and she'll watch over them. Let's gather our gifts.
Let's pray. Jesus, open up our minds. Open up our hearts that, that as we hear your word, our, our worlds might come into alignment with, with the world that you created, that we might see things as they really are, uh, not believing the lies that we've been told, the deceptions that we've followed. Set us free, Lord, from lust. In your name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks to us uh, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, and he says this, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better to lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. It's a little weird when they send the children away right before you preach, right? Um, <laughs> I usually uh, show a lot of pictures in my sermons, but with a topic like lust, you are pretty limited uh, as to what you can show. Uh, but it is a hard topic to sleep through nevertheless, and, and I hope... Uh, that you are encouraged, I hope you're challenged, and I hope you are uh, set free to see things as they really are here tonight. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling us how to live in every area of our lives. It goes on for three magnificent chapters there in the Gospel of Matthew, and love and sex is just one of those areas that Jesus touches on and wants us to convert to him. Now, when you read those words about plucking out eyeballs and cutting off hands and, and going to hell, it sounds harsh upon first reading. And many people think that Jesus is saying that if you have any sexual desire whatsoever, it is a sin that needs to be severely dealt with. People have been teaching that lie for millennia. It's a great misunderstanding, and my goal tonight is uh, to show the, the biblical, the Christian understanding of sex. And while it is truly different than, than the ideas about sex that we hear in our culture and in our world, I believe that the Christian idea of sex is one of the most attractive things about our faith. We're going to look at three things tonight. We're going to look at the integrity of sex. We're going to look at the challenge of lust. And we're going to talk about the future of love. But let's jump right in and start with the integrity of sex. Verse 27 said, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Jesus is assuming with those words that his audience understands an Old Testament idea of what the sex ideal was. And Jesus is accepting that Old Testament teaching. He's saying there was a wonderful ideal, and now I'm going to explain it to you further. I'm going to build upon what you have heard before. He's accepting the Old Testament sex ethic and building on it. So what is the Old Testament sex ethic? It comes down to one word, covenant. The Old Testament said that there is no sex allowed outside of a covenant. Or to put it in a more positive light, that sex is only allowed within a covenant. Today that means for us that sex is only permissible in the eyes of God. It's only beneficial for us, according to God, within the boundaries of a loving marriage. It's a covenant. And I know that word covenant sounds so old, and, and some people want to just update the ideas that we have about sex. Aren't we stuck in the past? Covenant sounds so serious. Why do we take sex so seriously? It's kind of a, a loose affair in today's world. But my friends, we can't get rid of the word covenant because covenant's not just a word. It is a whole category of thought that, that goes throughout the Old and the New Testaments into our lives today. You see, a covenant creates a relationship that is far more loving and intimate than a merely legal relationship. But it's also far more binding and enduring than a merely emotional relationship. You see, a covenant becomes more loving because it's legal. 
And the opposite of a covenant relationship is a consumer relationship. And unfortunately, consumer relationships define most of the relationships that we see in our world today. In fact, there are too many, far too many consumer relationships in the church. A consumer relationship is a relationship like you have with your car. I mean, it's great at first, right? It's new and it, it runs well, but, but after a while it starts to break down and it starts to feel old and, and the new models start to come out. And you start looking for an upgrade. And you might say to your car, you know, you and I had this great thing going, but, you know, our relationship is built on me getting my needs and my desires satisfied. And you're no longer satisfying me. And, and my needs and my desires are more important than our relationship. And this is no big deal when it comes to cars, but when we turn human relationships into consumer relationships, things get ugly really fast. In a consumer relationship, you say, you adjust to me or I'm out of here. And this is the opposite of a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship says, I will adjust to you because I've made a promise. The relationship in a covenant is more important than my needs and my desires at any given moment, even my needs and desires over a long period of time because I made a promise to this relationship. You see, connection is the goal of covenant. Two parties coming together to do life together. Not me getting what I want out of you, but us doing life together. It's all about connection. And when people come to me and, and their marriages are hurting and on the rocks, and I can, I can hear them both say, you know what, connection is what we need. We, we've somehow lost this, but we're both covenanted. We're both people who want connection. My heart leaps because I'm so excited because I know that God can bring those two back together because they both want connection. But if one person is a consumer and the other person is a covenanter, my heart drops because it's going to be bad for the covenanter. They're going to get exploited by the consumer. But my friends, if both parties, if both of those spouses are covenanters, oh my, at least three really cool things are about to happen. The first is, if, if you're in a covenant relationship, two people covenanting together, you're going to be safe and secure. You will finally have a zone of security in your life, a safe place where you can at long last just be yourself. Now, I don't want to get too graphic, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes you, you leave things as presents for people, and they don't, they don't smell so nice, and you can just be yourself, and then your feet are kind of gross, but people let you touch them and everything. I mean, it gets really safe and secure in a covenant, amen? But in a consumer relationship, you're always marketing your best qualities. You're hoping that the other person is going to buy. They're going to they're finally see that you're worth it. Or maybe you're trying to figure out if you want what the other person is selling. And there's no peace and there's no rest because you're always trying to see if, if they're what you want or if maybe there's something better. It's like never-ending shopping, which sounds like hell to me. Amen? <laughs> My wife's home with the kids and I, they're sick, so I'm, I could say that. Uh, <laughs> In a covenant marriage, we finally let to get to let the walls come down and stop spinning and stop looking and stop searching for something else. You can finally just rest together. The second thing we get uh, when two people are covenanting is you are committed in spite of your feelings. And guess what? When you do that, Deeper feelings grow. Because when I'm in a relationship, no matter what, for the rest of my life, I find all kinds of new feelings and new reasons for being there that I never knew existed. Because I go deeper than I ever imagined going. Why? Because I have to. I have to learn how to see past broken things and problems. I have to learn how to see how to... How to reach in there and pull the best 
out of this spouse that I love so much and have covenanted to. Now, this is so obvious in, in the other covenant relationship that many of us will experience. I don't know why we have such a hard time figuring this out in our marriages. The relationship between a parent and a child is the other covenant relationship that God gives to us in this life, many of us. Anyway, Doug's about to get into this right here, and, and, I, and I laugh about it every time I think about it. He has no idea what he's in store for, amen? Amen. You all know if you've parented anyone, you know that you are not going to get almost anything back from those kids that you poured in, right? You're going to just keep giving and loving and pouring, finding out new ways, and they're just going to keep taking and taking and taking. You always have to adjust. You always have to give more. You have to learn how to let go. And then they grow up and they move out, and you have to learn how to love them in other ways that you never bargained for in your life. And when they mess up, if you're in a covenant with them, you don't quit. You just turn the love up even more to levels you didn't know existed. And you hang in there with them because they're yours. And you belong to them and they belong to you. And the same is true in a covenant marriage. The day, the moment that I told Sarah I was an alcoholic, that is when I learned beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were in a covenant marriage because she looked at me with this horrible news just dropped out of nowhere and she said, I'm not going anywhere. What are we going to do next? That is a covenant. The third thing, that we get when two people are coveting, covenanting is there is more freedom in a covenant than outside of it. And this is the opposite of what the world will try to teach you. Soren Kierkegaard said that if we're in a relationship where I have to feel fine all the time, then I am a slave to my feelings. And my friends, emotional slavery is alive and well in 21st century America. Now where do so many of our feelings come from? Some of them are produced by our bad thinking. Some of it is produced by just off-brain chemistry. A lot of times your past will come up and creep up behind you, and it'll kind of make you feel some weird things. Or sometimes circumstances just come down on you, and your feelings rise up. You're not even trying to feel these things. It just comes out of you. These things are beyond your control. So if feelings are determining your decisions, you are a slave to things that are beyond your control. And this is when anger and fear and resentment and worry start running the show of your life. Do you want to get free of those things? Then I encourage you to make a covenant promise and stop being a consumer of relationships. Now, what does all this have to do with sex? Everything. The world says that sex is a consumer good, that you have a legitimate need to feel good, to feel connected, to feel loved and adored. And my friends, I do believe that all of us have that legitimate need, but the world says the way to get those things, to feel good and connected and loved, is to go and find someone else to give you what you want. Do you hear how selfish that is? The Bible says that sex is designed as a covenant good. Sex becomes like a sacrament, according to God. It is a visible sign of an invisible reality. As I open up my body to you, I open up my entire life to you, all my hopes, all my dreams, I open myself to you. That is what sex reflects all of us. Sex becomes a vehicle for total self-giving. In marriage, being naked is a sign of what I've done with my whole life. I make myself completely vulnerable to you. You can hurt me like no one else in the world can hurt me. But I'm going to trust you to please not. And I'm going to forgive you when you do. Sex outside of marriage lacks integrity. You are doing with your body what you are unwilling to do with your life. Or you're asking someone else to do it just to meet your desire. You're saying to them, well, I want your body, but I don't want the rest of you. That's too much of a hassle. Just give me what I want. 
Do you see how selfish that is? C.S. Lewis said this. He said, the monstrosity of sex outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all other kinds of union which were intended to go with it and make up the total union. Sex outside of marriage lacks integrity, and sex inside of marriage doesn't. It can be a magical, amazing, mysterious thing. Sex within a covenant marriage can be a renewal ceremony. It's like getting remarried all over again every time the two of you come together after a long, hard day. Sex between a loving husband and a loving wife in a covenant marriage is a nurturing and healing thing to both of them. It's covenant cement. It's not a consumer good. It binds two people together as they make their way through what for all of us is a very difficult life. But when sex becomes a consumer good, when it's about taking what you want rather than giving, when you use sex like a consumer good, you damage your ability to use it as covenant cement in the future. You're not just going to get away with it. John White, a Christian psychologist, said it like this. He said, the bodily exposure that arouses and accompanies sex can be profoundly symbolic and healing if it's the concrete sign of what's happening in the whole relationship. So it only makes sense that sexual relations can be confined to marriage because mutual disclosure and tender acceptance is not the activity of a moment, but the fabric of a lifetime's weaving. How many people trade what could be a lifetime of love and connection, of healing, for a moment of pleasure, unwilling to commit the rest of themselves to it? You see, every time that sex is given physically without full disclosure, some of its giving and healing nature is destroyed. You might be thinking, well, come on, pastors, 2016, and attitudes have changed. Things aren't the way they used to be, and the church kind of needs to catch up. Get with the times. Let me push back on that a little bit. Would you agree that science is changing what we know about human relationships? Would we all agree with that? I mean, we're discovering new stuff all the time, and I like science, especially when it agrees with the Bible. Even the New York Times agrees with me. A few years ago, they published an article called The Downside of Cohabitation. And in this article, it said that three out of four young people believe that cohabiting before marriage is going to help them make a better decision about who to marry. But when they did all the research and they, they counted up all the facts and the figures, they realized that the truth is if you cohabit before you get married, you are far more likely to get a divorce. Because men and women both agreed that their standards were lower for a live-in partner than they were for a spouse. You see, they weren't practicing marriage when they were cohabiting. They were practicing something less. Living together is a consumer relationship. And sex is marketing. Living together in no way prepares you for marriage. It trains you, rather, to be consumers after you get married. You practice and you practice, and then when you finally get married, you keep on doing these things. And I know how countercultural and counterintuitive this is, and I know it's hard to hear. But that's just my first point. <laughs> the integrity of sex is that you must not do with your body what you are not willing to do with your whole life. Which brings us to our second point. The challenge of lust. Jesus wants to talk about our minds and our thinking as well. Matthew verse 25, verse 28 said, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The world reads this and, and thinks about it and says, Jesus is saying that all kinds of sexual attraction and desire is bad, and if you engage in these things, then you go to hell. And too many grandmas and grandpas have tried that, and too many preachers have preached that. 
But that's not what Jesus is saying. You see, there are a lot of words there that Jesus could have used to describe lust. And he used this really rare, weird, Aramaic word that Matthew then translated into Greek. And it's this. It's epithumesi. Everybody say epithumesi. Which means lust or greed or idolatry. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But first let me say, the Bible is in no way opposed to sexual desire. I could take you to passages in the Song of Solomon that would make you blush right now. I mean, think about Genesis chapter 2. You have a naked man singing love songs to a naked woman in the presence of God. And that's how the Bible begins. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 19, husbands, you will thank me later. It says this. It says, a husband needs to be ravished with his wife's breasts. Can I get an amen? You're welcome. <laughs> the Bible rejoices in the glory of sexual love. In his sermon, Jesus isn't opposed to sexual desire within a covenant relationship. He's not even saying that it's wrong to find a person of the opposite sex attractive. We can all breathe now, right? Jesus is going after the epithumesi. He's going after lust as idolatry and greed. You see, greed is selfish. Now, concerning money, is there anything wrong with having money? No. There are plenty of rich people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they turn out just fine. You see, the problem is when your accumulation of money turns selfish, when you no longer use what God has blessed you with to bless other people, but you just want more for me, for my wants, for my desires. Then greed becomes an addiction. And an addiction is what you turn to in order to make life work for you. Money is what you trust in. And it's what you base your worth upon. And here you become dangerously close to stumbling into the great addiction of workaholism where it's all about just work and more and more and more. You know greed is a problem when it starts creeping into your fantasies. When getting more is what you think about. How I'm going to spend what I make, the things I'm going to buy, the places I'm going to go, how other people are going to treat me when they find out how much money I'm worth. You see, greed is a problem when you look to money to give you the things that only God can give you. And in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was saying, you can do exactly the same thing with sex that you guys do with money. There are four ways that sex turns selfish. Number one is through pornography and masturbation with pornography. You see, sex is forgiving. It is not a consumer good. And pornography with masturbation is nothing but consumerism. You don't even need another person. You get instant gratification of whatever selfish fantasy comes to mind. The second way that sex can turn selfish is all sex outside of marriage is inherently selfish. In the book Premarital Sex in America, it says this, it says, the vast majority of people who have sex outside of marriage, when asked why, say, in order to keep the relationship going. We've been on five or six dates, and I want to keep things going, so I had to have sex. We've been together for a few months, and, and we kind of wanted to keep things going, and so I had to have sex with him or sex with her. My friends, this is the consumer approach. In order to keep getting what I want or get more from the other person, I pay them. In sex. The third way that sex turns selfish is just the belief that you can't be a whole person without having regular sex. Now, if you're a Christian, and I hope everyone here is a Christian, then the only complete person that we have a model of is who? Jesus. And how many times did Jesus have sex? None. Ever. He taught us that the only thing that you and I need to be complete is a right relationship with God. Now, the instinct for sex is a God-given thing, and it's a creative instinct. 
But it can be, sometimes must be, sublimated into other creative pathways. We need to channel all that energy and all those desires into creative activities. Just because you're in puberty doesn't mean you need to go out and have sex with the first person that comes and show some love towards you, show some affection towards you. We need to sublimate those things, pour those energies into growing up. If you're, if you're a grown-up, Maybe you need to sublimate it and channel those energies into taking care of other people or growing up emotionally or spiritually, becoming all that God wants you to be rather than trying to find your fulfillment in something cheap that doesn't last. The fourth way is the fairy tale of marriage and family. And this is the most subtle form of sexual idolatry because it doesn't feel sexual. Many people uh, have in their mind a fairy tale idea of what marriage is going to be, of what family is going to be, and my kids are going to be. I'm going to have the perfect house someday. And when I get all these things, then finally, I'll be happy. You are making an idol out of romance, if this is you. And you're just as guilty of lust as the person who has a porn addiction. So, why is Jesus so interested in sexual idolatry? Does love even have a future in our lust-obsessed world? How are we going to get deliverance from this oversexed culture? Jesus hints at it when he talks about hell. In verse 29, he said, If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. Because it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And that word hell has all kinds of connotations for many different people. But here Jesus actually uses the word Gehenna. And Gehenna was a place right outside of Jerusalem where they would throw all the trash and they lit it on fire. And it smelled horrible and nobody ever wanted to go there because the fires never stopped burning. They were unquenchable. He is saying that your lust is a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. And people who get wrapped up in, in using sex selfishly end up seeing their relationships go to hell. You see, my friends, we were built for God. And if we lose God, we lose that connection, then we lose all ability to be satisfied no matter what else we try. And sex outside of marriage points to this. It points to us trying to find fulfillment it holds out the promise that that fulfillment, that connection is just right there if you just take it. But all it delivers is the ability to destroy being yourself. And it destroys your freedom. So, if sex outside of a covenant marriage points us to hell, where do you think sex within a covenant marriage points us? Heaven. Well, you guys are so smart. Ephesians chapter 5 says, The most rapturous love between a husband and wife is but a dim look at what eternity with our one true spouse will be like. I love the story in John chapter 4 of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus comes to the Samaritan woman by herself in the heat of the day, and he just sits down and, and waits for this conversation to unfold. And in this conversation, he tells the Samaritan woman that, I have water. That will satisfy every longing and every need you've ever had. And she looks with hope. And she says, give me some of that water. And then he says, bring me your husband. You say, well, why is Jesus talking about husbands here? And she says, well, I don't have one. And Jesus sees right through her. And he says, you've had five. So why is Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well saying, I have water that, that will satisfy everything? Why is he so interested in her messed up sex life? What he's saying to her is this. He's saying, you've been looking for your deepest longings to be satisfied by men. Not once or twice or four times, but five times you've tried this and you failed every time. But that deep love, that connection, that closure exists, but it only exists with me. It only exists if you come to me. And then she turns to him and says, I can see that you're a prophet because you saw right through me to my deepest need. 
You will never be married well or single well unless Jesus is the spouse of your soul. If my wife Sarah's relationship with God isn't greater than hers with me and vice versa, if Jesus isn't both of our main spouse, we're going to fall back into a consumer relationship and we will start using each other. But we long for covenant with God and with each other. And I believe that every human heart longs for covenant. And when it comes to covenant, God's plan is the only game in town. I want to invite you to join me as we put to death that kind of lust that is idolatry and greed, and we ask God to replace it with his covenant of love for him and for each other. Let's surrender our lust to God. The wages of lust is death. Let's pray. Lord, take it all from us. All of our our idols, all of our greed, all of our lusting after things that, that you never intended us to desire, Lord. But we've become so twisted up that we chase after them. Set us back on your straight path, on your narrow way. As we make our way through this life, let us collect relationships that last as our relationship with you will last forever. Help us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Please rise and receive the benediction of the Lord. He has made a covenant with each of you that he will be your God and you will be his people forever. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with kindness and covenant love and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I trust that every one of us uh, was strengthened and had um, just issues made ever more clear than we ever recognized. And uh, may you be blessed. May you celebrate life together and uh, love on each other lots. Your preachers will greet you.